thought leader and corporate manager, this is a rare pleasure for me to be sitting here with Eric, who's a, a pioneer on so many levels. I meet many entrepreneurs, many, many players from the institutional side, and corporate players, but rarely do I have an opportunity to meet a pioneer who has so much accrued experience in all three sectors and can put that dynamic value to work. So thank you for joining us, Eric. Yeah. Um, you have a mic or <laughs> See, we ask and we shall receive. Um, so let's start. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with Eric's pedigree, uh, he, was a, he was the chairman of Freecom. He started a corporate venture fund before it was fashionable as a, as a pioneer serial entrepreneur, and now you've been investing for 15 years, 14 years, right? Um, so first, tell me a little bit about, uh, for, our, for the benefit of our audience, you do early stage investing, yes? That's right. So help us, there's been a nomenclature problem, and I'd like to try to clarify a little bit between what does early stage mean to you? Is it proceed? And help us understand some clarity, because it's changed, yeah? It has changed, particularly in the last four or five years. So the, the goalposts are changing, uh, so it's perhaps a better way to describe early stage for us is uh, we like to catch companies when they already have a product. Uh, we do not want to incur the technology risk, so we want to see a product working. And uh, we want to see a few customers. It doesn't have to be lots, but uh, a basic uh, first level of customer acceptance of the product. Sometimes this is called C, sometimes this is called Series A, sometimes it's called something else. But for us, this is what, what, what we seek to, to catch, which is companies right at this stage of the trajectory. This means that there is still a significant risk of a broad market acceptance. Uh, the product market fit is not confirmed. And so certainly there's the entire company building risk ahead. And those risks we're comfortable taking. What we don't want to expose our LPs to is that the product basically not working because of some fundamental flaw in the technology. There are other investors upstream from us who are comfortable with that, but uh, that's, that's basically a sweet spot. And then, of course, we stay with these companies until uh, they no longer need us. Lots of dry powder, I'm sure. Right? That's right, that's right. So, the world has changed. And let's talk about a little bit about your venture experience. And we'll go through each sector. I think it's all really quite relevant. It's a rare pleasure to have someone with such a crude experience. So, in the last 15 years, the world has changed. You know, it used to be, you know, to seed a company, to get it started, you were looking at a $250,000 investment, then it's a $50,000 investment, and, and, and now, you know, it's a kid in a closet. You know, so so the, the question is, the, the world has changed, so has, how has your investment thesis changed in terms of market adoption? Well, uh, the world has changed in, in the sense that uh, it takes more capital to build companies to critical mass. However, it takes less capital to get them started. So you have to somehow uh, make these two realities fit together. So, so what's happening is that you have a bit of a, of a changing of uh, naming conventions. Um, today, when a company reaches Series A, it is very common that it has already raised five to six or seven or eight million dollars. It has had maybe two or three rounds of financing already. These rounds may, may have been called uh, angel or seed or seed plus or pre-seed even. So multiple rounds, but by the time the company is series A ready, it has products, it has customers, it has perhaps a full team. And basically this is what we would have called series B or C right. 15 years ago. Yeah, so it's almost as if A now is the new C. Right? Yeah, it's almost that, that's yeah. right. So, which is why I, I prefer to, to describe points in the trajectory as opposed to rely upon a, a, a name or letter in the alphabet because these things just keep changing. Oh, I get it. And the, the reality is that today, uh, and in fact I reviewed these stats as recently as uh, uh, Monday, um, companies <coughs> wanting to get financing are fortunate that there is more capital than ever before pouring into the innovation economy. However, very few are elected as a percentage. So it's, it's basically the same phenomenon as if, uh, if you try to get accepted to a Stanford graduate school. <laughs> more and more candidates, acceptance rates lower and lower and lower. So, so today, uh, this, we're basically funding the same number of deals as six or seven years ago, but we're putting maybe 
two to two and a half times more capital to work behind the same number of companies. Um, so let me ask you just one side of our question. When you, how much operational value add do you see, do you try to contribute to your investments? You're one of these eclectic um, sort of a renaissance man, I guess is the best way to describe it because you do have tremendous operational, you, you understand what it takes for corporate adoption, how to navigate that minefield to, to see, you know, on a, on a global scale, how much are you able to help some of the companies that, you're, that, you, that you look at when you, when you decide to pull the trigger on? Well, the operational expertise is, is one of the things which uh, we pride ourselves in contributing to our companies. Uh, every partner in the firm has built companies, small, medium, large, and, and even very large. So we have experienced the sort of uh, dangers and pitfalls and mistakes that uh, our entrepreneurs are likely to face, and we try to, to, to avoid them. So there's an expectation that we set with our, with our entrepreneurs that if, if we invest, we expect to work very closely with them. Uh, we expect to be in their face, but, uh, but by and large, uh, helpful. Um, and and we'll, be, we'll be active. This is our style of investments. So obviously, it, it leads us to having a more concentrated portfolio because there's only so many hours in the day. So uh, unlike most early stage funds, we would not spread our bets too thin. We'd make a few concentrated bets and invest a lot of our time and the capital behind these few companies who we think will be winners. On behalf of those companies, I think they're very lucky you're able to invest. Um, so let's talk about the, the core issue of dealing with cross-border investing because obviously the, the markets are globalizing. And they're, they're, what is it that you look for in terms of the localization of value and, and things that you're looking to avoid, uh, issues dealing with uh, uh, syndication, uh, um, especially with this U.S.-China issue? What is it that you look for? Well, firstly, let me say that uh, we really are believers in cross-border investing. I would say that uh, all of our portfolio companies, except for one, are cross-border. And we're about 30 companies in, in the portfolio today. So the reason is that, let's face it, we're sitting in uh, probably the epicenter of the most expensive zip codes in the planet. So this is not the right place to build a company. It's the right place to, to have a presence to have a nerve center for your business, and it's the right place from which to make connections. So we love companies who start from somewhere else. They can start from China, from Europe, from India. We're somewhat indifferent there. Uh, they're smart people all over the planet. And it's great that they start in the place where they have, they understand the ecosystem, they have relationships, they can build teams, they can build products. But at some point, if they're serious about building a significant company that has an impact, particularly in enterprise IT technologies, they have to be here. Uh, so this is where we, we try to intersect these companies. So for us, cross-border investing means that. It means uh, having the nerve center, particularly all, all the strategic decisions that, uh, that determine uh, go-to-market choices, they have to be made here, uh, having knowledge of the key actors who are headquartered here. We're very comfortable, in fact, we encourage companies to keep building their back-end and their R&D in the best possible places where they think they have a competitive advantage. Uh, China is one special case. We have a special relationship with Israeli entrepreneurs. We have an office there. So we have about uh, a third of our deal flow from Israel, an increasing amount from uh, Western Europe, France in particular, but a significant amount from China and, and India as well. So. Cross-border investing is, requires a very different skill sets than uh, the skill set of the venture investors who backed me when I was a young entrepreneur uh, in the early 80s. In those days, the expectation from venture capitalists is that they could, they could literally drive to every single one of the portfolio companies and see everybody there. So, so the world is changing, and, and so let's talk about risk mitigation. As, yeah. as, an, as, a, as a seasoned investor, um, the issue of, if you, let's say you have a technology company coming from China, for example, or Israel is, is an exception because you have a, a boots on the ground presence. But if you're coming from Holland or, or you're doing cross-border investment, you as an investor have a responsibility and a desire to mitigate risk in every facet as one can. So what is it that you look for in terms of a syndicate partner to help look after your interests if it's a foreign investment? You know, you're, 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 there's a lot of, 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 they don't have a presence in the U.S. or they don't have a, 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 a beachhead, 
how do you deal with that? How, what do you look for in terms of a, the, the qualities in the syndicate partner? So in, in two words, we look for expertise and collegiality. I'm sorry, say again? Collegiality. You want to... Being a colleague, being somebody that you can work with around the board table. So, and these, these two skills are quite rare. Notice that I did not mention capital because we live in an era of capital abundance. An immense amount of capital that's, that's one ticket invested in, in, in the, innovation, the innovation economy. So capital is not a problem. Um, there are plenty of investment companies, some of them call themselves venture funds, who have access to plenty of capital. So for us, what matters is we want to, we want to work with people who really understand the art of company building. I say the art because it's not a science. It's a people game. So we want to, we want to work with people who have built businesses before, who understand the pitfalls, who can be active, who can be value add, value add in a real sense. So opening doors, coaching entrepreneurs, helping to fill out the team, um, and helping to broker relationships. We want people like that, and people who will step up when the company encounters crisis. And by the way, they always do. If you want to invest in early stage companies, <clears throat> you know that uh, even the best ones will, will have near death experiences. So we want to have people that we can count on at our side, uh, working with these, uh, these entrepreneurs. And we want people who, have, uh, that, who are collaborators. There are people in the valley who are extremely smart, there's no shortage of that, but also extremely opinionated and unwilling to compromise on any one of their views. Well, we will politely decline engaging with these people. So clearly you love shyness, right? Uh, so let's talk about one uh, aspect that's, that's close to my heart about corporate venture. So when you first started the, the corporate venture fund at 3Com back in the day, people generally associated corporate venture with M&A. And for those of you that aren't familiar with, in the corporate venture world, it's almost the size of, of traditional institutional capital now. Um, in the last three years, the back-end deals uh, have grown 295%, and I attribute that to the explosion of the, uh, of the, uh, of the unicorns. But the, the, this, the participation in the C round has grown 100%. The participation in the, the B round has grown 60%. There's a seismic shift of corporates that want to participate and co-architect with companies on a much earlier level. So given your experience, how important when it comes to market adoption, um, and it's not about the corporate money, but about the corporate value that it brings with it, um, how important and relevant it is as, as you grow and, and foster value with your investments is corporate participation. Uh, for us, it's absolutely essential. Uh, we know that when we, when we invest in a company, assuming we have a positive exit, uh, there's a 90% chance this exit will be through corporate M&A. Yeah. So we have to make corporate friends as early as possible in the life of these, these companies. We have to choose wisely because sometimes these relationships can, be, uh, um, can close doors, more doors than they can open. Um, but in general, uh, a relationship with corporate ventures is not only never inevitable, it is desired. So we work, we have a corporate average program in our firm. It's, it's modest, of course, we're not a huge firm, but, uh, but we try to, to be close to the strategic agendas of maybe a dozen major corporate actors in, in our field. And we probably have another two or three dozen, so perhaps one level removed, but it's, it's an essential part of the, of the formula. So the, 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 there's, a, there's at least two broad kinds of, uh, of CVCs. Uh, you have some who are pretty much like any other institutional VC. They're, they're financially driven. Like Google, Google and, yeah, and, yeah, and talent. So. Yeah, and Google has multiple arms uh, from which they, they invest, um, or SAP down the street and so on. So there, there, there are many like that. And frankly, there's no difference between them and, uh, let's say, a, a Kleiner Perkins or, or, or a benchmark. But then you have the others who really have, uh, are driven from a strategic agenda, who are collaborating very closely with the business units, line of business and so on, and typically need to have sponsorship from a, a business manager before they make any investments. Uh, these are the ones of interest to us. 
the first kind that I mentioned, basically, we, we make no difference between them and uh, and the traditional investors. And then there's the whole tactical. I mean, there's the, the DNA of the, and you clearly have a strong command of the, the DNA of the corporate, ranging from a very tactical, like a enterprise rental car ventures or Harley Davidson ventures or, or 7 Eleven ventures. Yeah. And not that one judges, but their, their returns look to be tactical versus, say, a GE or a Siemens or, or City. Yeah, that's right. I would say the biggest difference uh, between the CDCs of today and those that, uh, for example, the one that started in uh, about 20 years ago at, at 3Con, it was a $300 million corporate venture fund. The biggest difference is that today, just about any company from any company of substance in any vertical has some kind of a CDC arm, and it tends to be headquartered here. Let me leave you with one comment. A, a, a very respected colleague of mine I know for many years, Austin Rona runs Sony Ventures, and he's the exception to the rule. He says, uh, unlike many of my corporate venture friends, he said the hard work begins after the investment is complete. And he doesn't take on an investment unless there's the assurance of business unit adoption. Yeah. So he understands that, that in order to make that, they're, they're not there for the money, they're there for the value. Yeah. Uh, we knew, we knew Austin very well, and uh, we respect his, uh, the way he's built the practice there at Sony uh, very well. Mm -hmm. Just to, to give you an example of somebody that uh, I would never have thought would have existed, um, a large French food conglomerate named Danone now has a venture arm. And this venture arm is in New York and here. And as it turns out, Danone Ventures has relevance to uh, the food robotics investments that we're making today. It makes a lot of sense to have to bring Danone into a cap table of these companies because uh, they have access to the, the ultimate customers. Right. That and the want. channels and markets. Absolutely. But alas, our time is up. Eric, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and your contribution. Thank you very much, all.